Welcome back, everyone. I'm very excited to talk to you all today about the black sheep of the franchise. Final Fantasy II really didn't want to stay formulaic and want to shake things up, so to speak. Above all, this game wanted to emphasize choice and presentation, which was especially daring at the time, as most other companies were sick to the same formula, continuing to milk genres and mechanics dry, with SNK as a prime example during the time period. For one reason or another, this game is the least popular Final Fantasy by a wide margin, and I want to find out why. Loading up the game, we're treated to our first significant logo of the franchise. It's a long-running tradition for Final Fantasy to have logos which are story-relevant. Here, we see a beautifully stylized Emperor Palamecia, the main antagonist. The pink hue is also reminiscent of the Wild Rose Rebellion, an organization that the protagonist will be a part of. Moving on towards character creation, we're given a big shock uh, compared to the first game. In addition to getting canonical names, being Ferian, Guy, Maria, and Leon respectively, the class system is entirely thrown out. No one would ever have thought that an RPG game of the time would deviate so heavily from the classic D&D form. Right off the bat, we can see that they're taking risks. We enter a world in which peace was long held, but now being burned by the Flames of War. The Palamecian Empire has launched a conquest of world domination, using his armies and the creatures of the underworld as his pawns. A rebel army in the Kingdom of Finn sprung up to put an end to the Emperor, but has lost many fortifications and soldiers in their efforts. The rebels withdrew to a small town, Altair, which is where they currently reside. Here, we're introduced to four recently orphaned refugees. We're thrust into a combat encounter against the Legion of Black Knights, but we're powerless against them and lose a scripted defeat. And what I was saying earlier about the presentation? This is what I meant. Use of limited animation, cutscenes, and gameplay lends to a strong sense of lunar narrative dissonance, or how well a narrative is told through interactions with the mechanics themselves. The story is being reinforced by the gameplay, a feature entirely unique to the genre. The flare seat here is quite unlike what we saw in the first Final Fantasy, and is much more effective at drawing players in. Our main man, Furion, wakes up to meet this chick, Hilda. She's the leader of the Wild Rose Rebellion, and we also meet Minwoo, her right-hand man. With some exposition, we learn about a massive Imperial Dreadnought being constructed in Basque, and its completion would threaten the world. Furion reunites with silent Chad Guy and female character A, Maria, but the third child, Leon, is still missing. The trio meets with Hilda, and we learn the Rebellion password, Wild Rose. The password system is a charming but surface-level implementation, which only further immersed me made the world feel more realistic. Of course, if you're an underground resistance, you'd have a series of code words to disguise your intentions from the ever-encroaching Imperial forces. You can ask certain individuals about specific passwords to glean more information about that topic, either leading you to a new objective or simply just explaining it in more detail. It offers no more depth than that, so the system became a little tedious as the game possessed, but not to the detrimental degree I see people talk about it. Once the party enters the adjacent room, the core mechanics are explained by these wizard dudes. There are seven types of weapons, swords, spears, axes, staves, knives, bows, and fists, and some require two hands to use, meaning they also can't equip a shield if that's the case. The biggest change in any Final Fantasy game happens here, and it's the fact that the level system is entirely removed. Instead, your stats increase with repeated exposure and use in combat. For example, taking damage will increase health, using swords will raise your sword level, and casting spells raises the spells levels and the amount of MP you have. On top of spells, we also finally have an MP bar, which drains with each cast, throwing away the D&D spell slots of the previous game. Party members can also be arranged in rows, able to be shifted uh, back and forth, leaving them out of melee range, but having to only use magic or bows as a trade-off. Instead of classes, you can give each character whatever weapon you want and raise their skill with it. It's a lot of customization, you can really make your character however you want them to be. I had Firion be an unarmed monk and white mage, Guy as a knight, and Maria as a black mage. Now looking at her surroundings, the town of Altair is a pretty standard fantasy town, all things considered. It features Victorian style housing and cobble pathways with small rivers intersecting the town. Through NPC dialogue, we learn that there's a rebel scout stationed in Finn, and that there's a secret wall hidden in the tavern. We do some light shopping, and then we set out into the wild to return to the now fallen kingdom of Finn. I feel like the battle system is incredibly unique, but also at the same time highly flawed. While it's extremely intriguing and interesting to ditch traditional leveling in favor of this system reminiscent of Dragon's Dogma, it kind of leads you to becoming overpowered way too quickly even without attacking your own party members to raise their own health, which was a 
pretty meta strategy I used near the end of the game. I love how it just gets me to actually cast spells though. It was an issue I struggled with in the first game. It's just in my nature, my hoarding rat nature. But it also meant that I'd spend an hour waiting outside of town, just grinding out levels on new spells to get them up to par with the rest of them. At one point in the game, you get the spell called Ultima, and that damage scales off of your how many total spells you have, the levels of those spells, and then your weapon proficiencies for each weapon. And trying to make that spell, which was meant to be super powerful, like story-wise is it very powerful, but trying to make that usable and prominent in the game, I think it took me five or six hours of just straight grinding. So it really just doesn't lend to easy play. If you don't do a deep dive online, you'll be extremely confused by a lot of hidden mechanics, especially the magic penalty system, in which magic power is lowered when using heavier armors and weapons. Unarmed attacks are also weirdly strong, which just confuses me a bit, as they shouldn't be stronger than literal fireballs and swords, and yet here we are. I guess it's kind of there to make up for the fact that we don't have a dedicated monk role, but at the same time, just anyone being able to do insane unarmed damage just doesn't feel quite right. One other massive win is the revamped battle theme, which is simply just a straight up improvement from the first game. Thank you, Nobu Uomatsu. Moving north, we stumble upon the small town of Getreo. Flowers bloom next to the quaint and lively buildings, and the whole town is surrounded by a scenic forest. The buildings are brick with tastefully overgrown vines, with wooden fencing and dirt paths guiding you around the town. There's nothing too notable here, it's just a place to rest before resuming our journey. I really love the place. It gave a nice breather in between all of the spell and health grinding. Out of Katrea, you have a multitude of directions, but you're meant to follow the lake up and to the right, or else you get party away by some strong monsters, just all Dark Souls style. You know, go on the left after filing shrine to the skeleton bit. Good times. The kingdom is overrun with imperial soldiers and monsters. We have to sneak around them. If we're drawn into combat with the knights, we'll suffer a repeat of the opening scene and get quickly wiped out. As we continue to see in Final Fantasy II, the presentation and storytelling through game mechanics is what's been taking priority. All of the buildings are either abandoned, ransacked, or occupied by the Imperial Army, and entering the tavern, we sneak into a hidden wall to find an injured rebel, Prince Scott. He's the brother of some cowardly knight back in Altair, and he's also engaged to Princess Hilda. His final request is to tell his brother to have faith in his strength, as well as delivering a letter to Hilda. The reason Finn fell so quickly to the Empire was because the rebel army was sabotaged. It was an inside job. A man named Count Borg had betrayed them, defecting to the Empire. So Prince Scott offers us his ring and then dies before the party's eyes. While not being an extremely effective scene at all, for the time being it really stepped up the story of Final Fantasy. Instead of nameless heroes generically saving the world from a demon, now we're entangled in rebel armies, wars, and betrayal. I think the scene could have been much more effective if we were to have met Count Borgen before his mention, or discover the traitor ourselves, but there's really only so much space in these old games. Despite that, the added weight of the story shaped the series going forward, as we'll get to see in later games. And with Scott's dying words, we return to Altair. Once we travel all the way back to the heart of the rebellion, we tell Scott's brother about his death and then move to Helda. Our safe return from Finn has proven us capable, and we're finally able to enlist in the rebellion officially. Currently, Hilda's goal is to obtain a metal known as Mithril, which is also a new keyword. Getting a supply of Mithril would place the rebels' equipment on par with the Empire's, so it's vital for their future operations. We're told to meet a man named Yosef in Salaman to have some leads on where to find some. Accompanied by Minwu, completing a party of four, we begin our travel into Salaman to meet Joseph, first by passing through the poor town of Palum. To ease the journey, we're given the canoe to travel across rivers. Minwu is a white mage with access to a ton of spells, but to compensate his melee skills and health are very subpar. He's the first out of a set of entertaining party members, another new change in Final Fantasy II. It has its own issues, but I'll tackle those a bit later. Palum and Poft are both stops along the way, and they're very charming. They fulfill the role of a poor town much better than their respective counterparts of Final Fantasy 1. It really looks and feels good to him, designed for sea bears and fishmongers. We take a short boat ride over to the neighboring port, Poft. In Poft, there are many of the same buildings, but the environment is much more green and lush. We can also meet a gruff man named Sid in a tavern offering travel services on his airship. It's awesome to be able to meet important NPCs before they're meant to encounter them, and even cooler when we can use the surface. From here, it's just more mindless traveling through the countryside, so I'll skip ahead to the next major story beat. 
Way further north, we arrive in Salamand. It's a snow-capped city with large walls surrounding the citizens. The coolest part about traveling to Salamand is the change of scenery. I don't recall even once seeing snow in the first Final Fantasy game, and so visiting the mountains and its inhabitants so early on was a breath of fresh air. But back to the more pressing matters, the townspeople are all freaking out, since the Empire is abducting townspeople to work in the mines to get Mithril. The party meets with Hilda's informant Yosef, but he's worried about the strangers, and Bert asks us to rescue the townsfolk from the Empire. With no other choices, the party agrees to aid Joseph and we head towards Summit Falls, where the mines are found. With Summit Falls, we finally reach the first dungeon of the game. Compared to the first Final Fantasy, the graphics are much more textured and advanced, and portrays a dank cave in verticality in a manner which is much more appealing than just the stairs of the first game. The cave is filled with hordes of goblins and imperial soldiers, which I mean, thankfully aren't a challenge at the time. We also come across many stunning crystals on our journey down the mines. Once the party makes it to the depths of the cave, they find the slaves crying out for help, as well as Joseph's daughter Nellie, who's being held hostage to scare him. I don't really get why that part was included. It's not story relevant for the entire game, and it doesn't even serve much of a purpose here in building up the stakes for Joseph's characters. Again, with Count Borgen and Prince Scott, they mentioned these things beforehand that have a lot more impact on the story and emotional depth, but because they're just thrown in, they just feel like useless plot points. Anyways, Rebellion Knight Paul escorts everyone out of the mine and we trudge even deeper down. At the end of the cave system, we come face to face with an Imperial Sergeant who's guarding the mithril that we need. The only thing of note here is the track that plays during the fight, a cool choir song, which is very serious and heavy, but the sitars in the background remind me of the Dalmechian mission from Final Fantasy XVI. We obtain the mithril and head back to Altair. The first dungeon was pretty underwhelming in terms of difficulty and level design, but I don't think it had to be and I don't hold it against the game since we're still early on and these kinds of things escalate nicely with time. Returning to Altair, we give the Mithril to the blacksmith Tobol, and now we can purchase any Mithril weapons and armor. The party reconvenes with Hilda and they receive their next assignment. The rebels have an inside man in Bosk, posing as an imperial soldier protecting the Dreadnought. We have to sneak in and sabotage the Dreadnought before it rains hellfire down upon the world. In Bovsk, we find the rebel spy at the corner of the town, guarding the entrance to the sewers. We learn that Count Borgen, the traitor who defected to the Empire, is now a general in the army and is governing the town. The people are being treated as slaves, but the conditions are much better than the ones they suffered under the Dark Knight, wherever that may be. The sewers of Bosk are a miniature set of mazes which are in too much trouble to navigate through. I could tell that the area wasn't designed to be a difficult zone, just in addition to lend to the atmosphere and story, a decision that we'll see countless times throughout the game. Square Enix really wanted to push the world building of the game to the center stage, and the entire world benefits from that choice. Unlike the first game, every part of the earth was fleshed out in its realistic context for its existence. After a few floors of sewers, we come face to face with the Dark Knight. In a shocking turn of events, the Square had their main characters loose. They weren't the heroes of the day. They failed to stop the Dreadnought's completion. Borgen appears and taunts us, and then the two of them rush off to the airship like the edgy bastards they are. In a side room, we loot a chest holding a past aboard the Dreadnought. Probably won't be important. We're treated to a very fancy cutscene as the Dreadnought takes flight and destroys the twin port cities and even Altair. The mood is set as the party starts on their solemn return. I have to say, it was very bold of the developers to allow our party to fail the mission. While any good story involves failing to a challenge then later overcoming it, the Warriors of Light in Final Fantasy 1 felt perfect, as if wherever they went, good things followed the perfect heroes who make no mistakes. But here, Fury and Guy and Maria aren't perfect heroes. They're not worries of light, they're kids getting caught up in something bigger than themselves and might be in over their heads. During the attack on Altair, many were killed, countless more were injured, and the sky was darkened with ash and smoke. The king is dying and the resistance is crumbling. Minu leads the party to tend to the king. If we talk to Sid on the way back from Boss, we learn a new keyword, Sunfire. Sunfire is the symbol of the Kashwan people, and the flame still burns in Kashwan's keep. If you can get close enough, the flame could be used to overload the Dreadnought's engine, or a final shot to turn the situation around. The king tells us that the flame is sealed away, and the torch can only be accessed with the goddess's bell, located in a snowy cavern to the north. Making our way there, we arrive back to Salamand, where we first meet up with Joseph. If we want to reach that cave, we'll need a special snow craft, but of course, this is just a narrative excuse so that we can have a fourth party member. The Snowcraft is hidden at an original first cave, Simon Falls, behind the same gemstones that I mentioned before. We retrieve the craft without any issue and onwards toward the cave. 
All the backtracking is beginning to feel monotonous, and I assume that reason for doing so is because the studio lacked either development time, money, or space in the game to add new locations to house these items. Entering the icy cavern, we ascend this freakishly tall ladder, and then after that we continue on with the puzzle. The cave is littered with undead and zombies, which are really weak to fire, just like everything else in the ice biome, so the difficulty was essentially non-existent. At the end of the cave, we meet these super cute giant beavers, who I just want to pick up and cut up for the rest of the video, god I wish I had one. In what was definitely the funniest moment of the entire game, Guy steps up to the king beaver, and Pele proclaims, Guy speak beaver, and the man speaks fluent goddamn beaver. There's a secret passage to the right which guards the bell, but it's guarded by an adamantoise, a very tough turtle who has high physical resistance. In the shrine behind him we receive the bell, and we can make our way towards Kashwan Keep. However, right as we're about to leave the cavern by going down the snake eater ladder, we're ambushed by Borgen, who finally engages in the fight, only to be laughably easy. On his death, however, a massive boulder comes rolling through the cavern, and in a moment of pure strength and manliness, Joseph sacrificed his life by single-handedly holding back the boulder until the trio escapes. Final Fantasy II is great at what modern Final Fantasies are getting a lot of heat for. It's not afraid to kill off characters in service of the story. And that alone is a massive upside in my enjoyment of the game. After bringing the news to Joseph's child, we report to Sid and Pop who lends us to Airship to travel to Cash One. After the sweet ride over to Cash One, we're set down in a forest clearing. If we run the opposite way of the keep, we can find something very special. Something which cements Final Fantasy II's legacy as something to be remembered. Yeah, this little guy right here, with his cute little music. This is a chocobo, one of the defining aspects of any Final Fantasy from here on out. He offers you smooth land travel without random encounters annoying you. Entering the ruins, we are immediately greeted by the sunfire, yet we still have no way of containing it. We'll come back around to this later, but for now we press on through the door ahead. I can see what Square was attempting here, to provide a more dramatic payoff for collecting the sunfire by dangling it just out of our reach, but has no effect here. As players, we don't actually care that much about harnessing the sunfire. Sure, we care about stopping the dreadnought, but there are no stakes involved in obtaining this generic plot relevant item. This unfortunate failure is a large part of why this area left a sour taste in my mouth once all was said and done. Going on to the door, we find Gordon who's also looking for Eggle's torch. He agrees to join our party and help us find the torch. It was around this point of the game that I started to just ignore the interchangeable party members and just focusing on leveling up the main trio. It takes too much time to get the new members up to a baseline level of usability, and it's pointless anyways because you know he's going to leave the party soon. We continue ascending and descending the twisted keep until the party finds themselves face to face with the monster guarding the torch, a bell pepper. Depending on the magic he used on the guy, he would heal his own HP, which is a very interesting mechanic, but it was still pretty dull by how little of an actual threat he was, just being a pepper. Behind him is Eagle's Torch, and we backtrack all the way back to the beginning of the keep. Now with the Sunfire being held within the torch, we can begin the trek to the Dreadnought. But as soon as we leave the fortress, we're put into a cutscene where the Dreadnought chases and captures Sid and his airship right out of the sky, forcing us to travel by Chocobo. There isn't much to say here story-wise, but the addition of chocobos are going to become a staple of the series, and the little lads are adorable, especially paired up with that music. We hop on the dude's back and we can travel basically anywhere on land quickly and without enemy encounters. We can cross the world to get back to the Singed Altair. By word of mouth, we hear rumors of an Imperial supply station up north, possibly where the Dreadnought would be docking. It's finally our time to clutch up and put an end to Palamecia's trump card. At the supply station, we can board the massive ship, and menacing music starts to play, laden with drums and horns to spell out our doom if our mission fails. We have to first pass a DPS check, determining if we're at the right level to stack up against these Imperial captains. After that initial hurdle, this is where the true headache begins. I'm so torn about this section. Everyone seems to love it, and it is undeniably awesome and atmospheric, but it was just so tedious for me when I played it. There's no real indication of where you're meant to be going, which is fine, but the ship is so massive that if you miss one turn, you'll be spending close to 8 minutes backtracking through multiple floors and fleeing from enemies. This section took me 3 times as long as it should have because I just missed a set of stairs and had to run all the way back from the bottom of the ship. It was mind-melting boredom. 
as you traverse through the Freiball Death you stumble upon Sid and Hilda, and you could free both of them. She planned to meet us at the Cash One Keep, but it obviously didn't work out. The two head for the airship as are tasked with overloading the engines. When you reach the bottommost layers, we have to traverse through immovable captains. You're not able to fight them. They're just an object you need to find the right path to walk around. After that section, we finally make it to the engine room. Despite my frustration with the area, I just can't deny how beautifully designed the large mechanical structures are. The animation and detail Square were able to glean out of these sprites are incredible. And if they lived literally throughout the entire ship, I think it genuinely would have made for a better experience. We toss the Sunfire into the engine, overheating the system. During the process, we're interrupted by the Dark Knight, and apparently Maria recognizes her voice. With no time to spare, we get a cinematic rush out of the crumbling ship, and the party scurries to Sid's airship. The presentation of the story and cinematography may have peaked here, and even now it still holds up when we take into account art and animation style the team were going for. We narrowly escape and land back in Altair. We're heavily congratulated by the people in the halls, but things aren't all of joys. The King's health is finally failing. In his final words, he inspires Gordon, once again reminding him of his courage and strength just like his fallen brother did earlier in the game. As such, he's made the head of the Rebellion's armies, and he takes to the position with honor. He also talks to Minwoo, this time about the ancient legend of an ultimate magic being sealed away, only to be accessed when the world stands at the edge of collapse. It's time to collect the Tome of Ultima. But first, the king asks Varian to travel to Deist, the home of the Dragoons, which is also another keyword. While the majority were wiped away due to Palamecia's invasions, the king believes that surely a handful must have survived the massacres. And with that, the king passes away, and the music which plays, while only seconds long, is inspiring. Inspirational enough to send us across the ocean to Deist. Deist is the home of the Dragoons, which is also another keyword. While the majority were wiped away due to Palamecia's invasions, the king believes that surely a handful must have survived the massacres. And with that, the king passes away. And the music which plays, while well, only seconds long, is inspiring. Inspirational enough to send us across the ocean to dice. The Dragoons are warriors who have a kinship with wyverns and fight clad in ornate black armor and brandishing long spears. We trek back to the Port of Poft, and a beautiful sailor offers to take us to dice. On the journey, however, she ambushes us, revealing herself to be no sailor, but rather Layla, captain of a band of pirates. Of course, the young heroes dispatch the pirates with ease, but instead of ditching the woman, the party invites Layla to help in the fight against the Empire, which she's surprisingly up for. With Gordon gone, Layla is now our fourth member. It makes no sense at all why Layla would want to help us after we brutally humiliate her and her crew, but I am a big fan of pirates, so I'll let this one slide. She guides us to Deist, found in the northeasternmost section of the map. Deist isn't a town, but rather a castle. Upon entering, a child spots us and warns us not to come any closer, or else the go tells Bon. We go up anyways, but we get mistaken for Imperial soldiers. After clearing up the confusion, we get their backstory. The wife's husband was a Dragoon, killed in the vicious attack by Palamecia. In the room behind them is the last living wyvern. She's trying her hardest to communicate to us, but she just can't breach the language barrier without a pendant found in the cavern of wyverns even further north. I think it's obvious what her next step is. The cavern is a pale blue, painted with moss and overgrown grass, and it's really quite beautiful. It gives me the same somber and intriguing vibe as the Ash Lake from Dark Souls, just granted a little bit more colorful. We get the pendant fairly easily and bring it back to the gold-plated wyvern. Now it's already too late for this beast to fight against the Empire. Its dying wish is for us to bring its egg to the bottom of the cave and submerge it in the spring of life. We launch that thing to the bottom of the spring, and nothing happens. For now, anyway. I gotta say, I love this part of the game. Dragoons and Wyverns have always been my biggest draw towards Final Fantasy games, and Final Fantasy media as a whole. It's probably why I love Monster Hunter so much, and it's chock full of Wyverns and has a lands, and you can't forget the Great Sword as well. Having a whole arc dedicated to the Wyvern itself is nice. So many times the creature just gets shafted just to give Dragoons more development, which I guess makes sense since the Dragoon is human and can communicate well, a Wyvern obviously can, but still. It was nice seeing the other side getting some love. With that leg of our journey complete, we reconvene at the mansion to meet with Hilda, who wants to talk with Varian alone. She lays in her bed and begins working her magic to seduce Varian. I mean, I don't blame her for catching feelings after everything we've done for her and Finn. She's backed up the talk too, I mean, just look at what a beauty she is. Oh, oh, oh. oh, ew. 
Ugh, the snake woman goes down without a hassle though, thank god. Even though Furian is all cut up in being catfish, my boy Guy comes in asking the hard-hitting questions like, We're a real princess. God, he really is the brain to this whole operation if you think about it. A guard busts through the door, and he somehow heard about a tournament being held in Palamecia, with the real Hilda as a prize. How the Palamecian king was able to abduct Hilda, and how the tournament spread so fast is beyond me, and it really shows how rudimentary the story can be at times due to its age. Layla is swapped out for Gordon, and we head to Palamecia for the first time. The Colosseum is located in the southwestern desert, standing tall with limestone and pale rock. Before we can confront the Emperor, the gates are locked in front of us and behind us, and we're put face to face for the very first time with the Behemoth, another future staple of the series. It's so iconic that it's even made its way into other series, once again bring up Monster Hunter as an example. He's changed a lot though, losing the bluer hue and fish-like tail. He's very resistant to damage, and can dish out some mean physical and magic damage. He's a foe to be reckoned with if you're not cheating the game with attack up spells like me. After defeating the Behemoth, we can take our chance on lunch at the Emperor, but he disappears at the last second, and then we're cornered by the Dark Knight. He throws everyone in jail. But my boy Gordon comes in clutch, and he takes out the guard. I knew he had it in him! Furion and the party reunite with Hilda, and we create diversion for Hilda and Gordon to escape. Finally getting out of that Colosseum, we head back to Old Terra, my beloved. Once in, we get an order from all the guards. The rebel army is finally ready to retake Castle Finn from the Empire's grasp. Let's do this. The castle is incredibly ornate, with glistening whites lining the floors and hallways, and deep blues, hinting at the rightful royalty who will soon reside within the palace. Before we head up the stairs, Layla rejoins the party, and we begin our ascent. Even though it's much easier on the eye, the castle is similar to all the other dungeons in its layout. Arriving at the throne room, we find a garden by a lone demon, Gatos. His design is menacing, but would be much more selfie or taller, and didn't look like the pixelated Funko Pop of Jafar mixed with the genie from Aladdin. Like most other bosses in the game, he's a pushover. Your strength snowballs like crazy over the course of the game, which is one of the largest complaints of the title. After killing the little demon man, Princess Hilda and Commander Gordon take their place on the thrones and get right down to business. Minwu was sent to Mysidia to receive the ultimate tome, but he still hasn't come back. So our next task is to go out and check on him. While it's been there from the start, this was the point in the game where I really started to get ticked off about the general quest structure. I know that heroes aren't just meant to be stand-ins for players, but being only a reactive force in the game is irksome and boring. We never take any action, we just follow orders. And the dev team spent so much to more time working on the story and creating actual characters for us to play as, then double down and have us play as characters. Don't just make more cookie cutter templates with names. That's just giving us half-baked protagonists. Mycidia is known as the Land of Mages, and the ultimate magic lies at the top of its tower. To access the tower, however, one going can need two masks. One is found beneath the castle after a short dungeon, simple enough, but the other one is a bit more troublesome. It's located deep within a tropical jungle, holed off in the middle of nowhere on an ocean. It's a twisting labyrinth which had me frightened that I wouldn't be able to make it out alive. It's long, and it's dark and it's grueling, and every party wave had me retry over and over and over again. It was all worth it, however, because once I made it to the bottom and found the masked tribe, they led me to the black mask I so desperately needed. With both masks in hand, we could finally travel to Mysidia, a grassy area filled with ancient ruins. A beautiful stream runs throughout the town, and the sites of further ruins could be found. One of these is the Mysidian Cave, which weirdly enough had a doppelganger Furion, who only vanished and let us pass once we handed over the black mask. I think this is meant to be more of a lore explanation on the masks, because they're just randomly thrown into the game and used in weird, unexplained ways, and it just left me confused by the end of it. Going deeper into the cave, we clear out all the enemies and end up with the crystal rod, an artifact that we need if we want to enter the Tower of Mysidia. Interestingly enough, the tower is located not on the mainland, but in a stretch of ocean directly west from Altair, so we rest there for a minute before setting out. However, as we approach the tower, something incredible happens. We lose Layla as we're swallowed whole by Mother Earth and the ocean itself. Where we're left as lava, but the walls don't seem rocky. And the backgrounds during battles make it look like we're almost inside of something. Some creature larger than anything we can even understand or imagine. Working beneath the depths to consume whatever draws near the tower with that remorse. Working our way through this hellscape, we find a man named Rickard, who's actually the last of the Dragoons, although his wyvern has been dead for a long time. 
He joins the party, and we venture to find our way out of whatever creature we're inside of. This was super awesome. It was just the coolest. Without a doubt, my favorite part of the game. The atmosphere, the setting, the surprise. Rickard is a new party member. All of it just scratches that itch which I wanted to feel at the Final Fantasy games I've played so far. Right at the Maw of the Beast, we find a ship already prepared to help us escape, so of course we take it. While there's no cool cutscenes to show us exiting the Leviathan, it's permissible after everything we're just shown. Now that we're out, the skyscraper of the tower is now accessible. The music shift here is absolutely sick. It's very Castlevania-y, or just very Halloween-y. The structure itself follows those same design cues of a haunted tower. The towers are soaked with blood and ominous statues line the wall with candles. I won't bore you with every minute detail, it's essentially just another gauntlet to test our strength and survivability. At the top of the tower, the party finally finds Minwoo, who has been testing the strength of the magical seal. Altogether, they focus their magic to attempt to tear down the barrier, and they do! Minwoo Kamehameha's his way through the door, but it costs him the last of his strength, and unfortunately the last of his life. With another ally fallen, we enter the room, absorbing the strength from the mystical orbs lining the tower, finally ending in the center. We unleash the ultimate magic, the ultimate tome. Here, I teach it to Furion, since he's the white mage of my party, and pretty much the main character of the game. What's interesting about this spell is that the damage doesn't scale with any of your magic stats. If damage is entirely dependent on the culmination of all your spell levels, how many spells you have, and the level of weapon skills. Having 16, level 16 spells, with maxed out stats for swords, shields, spears, etc., will make Ultima a weapon of mass destruction. The only problem? Grinding. You've most likely turned your characters into designated roles, not jacks of all trades, so it would take players like 5 or 6 hours of non-stop grinding like I did to make Ultima usable. And of course, that is exactly what I did, and it took me 8.5 hours. So I would not recommend doing this if anyone played Final Fantasy 2. But tragically, on our return from the tower, we found Altair raised to the ground. If we return to Hilda and the castle, we get the full story of what's going on. Nayla is safe and sound, but it turns out that the Emperor's magical power has grown so great that it can even control the wind. Each town we've been to, Poft, Palum, Altair, and even the quiet little Katrea were destroyed in the process. Bosk and Salaman still stand, but they are no use to the Empire or Resistance. Now, the cruel cyclone is headed on its way towards Finn. We can actually see it on the map too, right above the castle town. Before we tackle the cyclone, however, there's an instrumental item we need to make our run so much more bearable. Going to Paul's house in the castle town. I don't think I ever mentioned Paul. He's just like this friendly thief who hangs out around the town. We can ask him about the cyclone, and he'll lend us his stash of weapons. One of them is the blood sword. A straight sword which instead of doing flat damage, deals a percentage of the enemy's health instead. Super helpful for the final boss. The inside of this cyclone is one of our final tests of strength and skill. Just as I was wondering how we're going to get up to the thing, that wyvern egg we incubated sprung to life. Now we got a little dude to carry us up to the dungeon. After a horrendous party wipe 10 feet into the palace, I went up to grind, but came back feeling just fine. This is pretty much a copy paste of the sky dungeon with Tiamat from the first game, just with different and harder enemies. The look is entirely the same. It had that same aquamarine look you'd expect in a sky, or even a water dungeon. And on the seventh floor of the dungeon, we come face to face with the Emperor of Palamecia. Once and for all, we're locked in combat to overcome this threat who has been for too long in a shadow looming over the world. The Emperor throws wave after wave at us with a pattern of unity and friendship, and the most powerful spell makes him no match. Eventually, the Emperor himself engages in battle. We dispatch his goons with no trouble, and we blast the damned king to the cold pits of hell where he belongs. Shocked at his defeat, and despite his unwillingness to go, the Emperor dies at our hands. Back at the castle, we're thanked by the princess herself, and a party ensues. Beautiful music and elegant dancing. Peace has been restored at last. And these joyful pastimes can finally resume. But not all is perfect. As a soldier storms into the throne room, declaring the news that the Dark Knight Leon has declared himself Emperor and reorganizing the armies of Palamecia, and then the soldier falls to the ground dead. If it hasn't yet been made apparent, or if you do not remember, the fourth party member we began the game with, he was Leon. Maria's brother was a Dark Knight this entire time. Before resort to lethality, Maria pleads to talk with him and to make him see the error in his ways. 
with newfound strife, the party of four prepared to travel to the Palmesian kingdom, inaccessible by land and sea alike. We go to the only man who can help us now. Sid. But the attack on Poft and Palum did a number on his aging body, and while resting in bed, surrounded by the people he's grown so close to, he dies. But not before entrusting his airship to us. This was by far the most impactful death of the game. I actually really like Sid. I knew him from the beginning, and he was with us for almost the entire ride, supporting us wherever he could. His death was also what sparked my motivation to finish the last leg of the game, and reinvigorate that passion which I lost throughout all of this. Solemnly, we traveled to Poft to reclaim Sid's legacy, his airship. Sadly enough, the design of the castle is nothing special, so I can't dwell on it at all, and we just have to move on. The music is also the same. The location was really undersold and didn't live up to the hype necessary for being one of the final confrontations of the game, cornering the final enemies on their home turf after they trample on us for the entire game. We're finally done running from them and letting them force their power onto us, but the game doesn't make us feel that at all. It's treated just like Seven Falls 10 hours ago, treated just like the Mycidian Temple an hour ago. It's no different than anything else, and if one thing needs to be different, it was this. Arriving at the enemy's throne room, Leon confronts us. Maria tries to talk it out with him, but he's spouting the same generic stuff any fantasy billion would. Power rules the world. It's your power. The throne is mine. Weak-minded fool saying weak things. It's all very boring, when this should be one of the most greatest climaxes of the game. But what's more interesting than this? That's right, in the middle of his monologue, too. Bull. A rift appears, and with intimidating music comes out a newer, crueler, more menacing, and more terrifying Emperor of Palamecia. He ridicules Leon, but Rickard steps up to hold off the Emperor while he calls the Wyvern in to save the original four. And then this. Oh my god, dude, it's so sick. Arriving back at the Allied castle, Leon finally comes to his senses and joins the party. He was really the only party member I put any time into leveling, for obvious reasons. He's the last party member, and having a dark knight on the team is just so awesome. After I got all the more and more and more grinding, and so much, so much, so much more grinding out of the way, it's time to end things. For real this time. Okay, so. A strange hole has appeared in the center of an island in the south of the map. Entering it will transport us to the Jade Passage, a short, atmospheric, intense, and gorgeous dungeon filled with the hardest enemies in the game, like waves of dragons. At the end of the passage lies a one single teleporter. Okay, we're in hell. Everything is purple or made of glass, it's cold and icy like some depictions portray. But way more than the visuals, we're gonna focus on the music. Without a shadow of a doubt, Pandemonium is the best track made for a Final Fantasy game so far. Not even the intro comes close. It's fantastic. It's fervent, it's brutal, it's determined, and it's climactic. It's heroic and terrifying all at once. All of my gripes about the kingdom of Palamecia were answered here. It's a vocal track in Latin. It has interesting level design. It's visually unique from anything else they've encountered in the game. The enemies are all new and frightening and actually hard. You can find some bosses here too. The level design itself is thought through and different. If the developers are trying to make us feel like we're in another realm of existence, they certainly succeeded. It flips everything we knew about the dungeon design on its head for the final rush. And as a small side note, I don't know if they were in the first game, but we also see the enemy type Curl here, which will go on to be a mainstay. At the end of hell, he awaits us. He's uses big and scary words, just listen to this monologue. Sitting on his icy throne, he towers over the landscape. The Emperor fight also has its own unique boss track, and it's everything I could want. There are lots of musical stabs, vocals, and it doesn't try to be empowering or heroic at all. It's entirely in service of making the Emperor of Palamecia, no, the Emperor of Hell, the most terrifying creature we fought in any Final Fantasy game to date. But with that, we cut to his eventual defeat. We escape the dungeon and for a final time return to Princess Hilda. Things are finally over. With the combined efforts of both Kashwan and Finn, the kingdom and the world will be rebuilt stronger than before. All the named characters who are still alive thank us and congratulate us. Joseph's daughter thanks us with all of her heart, and the soul of Joseph appears just for a moment to wish us farewell, as does Minwu, Rickard, and Sid. Leon leaves for now. At least, he has to come to terms with his actions. And finally, we're given the last cutscene of the game. Now that it's over, 
I have to say that this game doesn't deserve its reputation in the slightest. It's very flawed and sometimes makes no sense at all, but it's fun. It's really fun. It brings in a lot of new concepts and mechanics and characters which are going to appear in every single Final Fantasy game going forward. In terms of legacy, this game impacted the series more than the first, despite public opinion. It started the trend of added character development and emotional attachment. I care about these characters. Maybe not the main characters, but characters nevertheless. And I know that going forward, I'm going to care about the next protagonists. Final Fantasy III was an exceptionally bold game. In some ways, it was ahead of its times, and in others, it fell behind. But just because of its faults, we cannot deny the impact it had on the series, and we cannot let it guide our judgment on what it undeniably did right. Thank you for watching. I'll see you guys in just a moment. Please like and subscribe, and tell your friends to subscribe. See ya.